So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, um, Natalie Schenker from Imperial College in London. Frau Schenker ist um, Wissenschaftlerin, Klinikerin, mm. Frauenmilchbankerin. Sie hat die um, Hearts Milk Foundation mitgegründet und ist um, Leiterin der Frauenmilchbank am Imperial College. Und was so ganz besonders ist an ihr, dass sie neben ihrer klinischen Arbeit, neben ihrer Arbeit als Managerin der Frauenmilchbank auch immer wieder den Kopf frei hat, den Blick zu heben, über den Tellerrand zu schauen, über das, was wir so mit wir und so in dem ähm, alltäglichen Geschäft in der Frauenmilchbank und in der Klinik ähm, beschäftigen. Und ähm, sie wird sich beschäftigen mit dem ökologischen Impact von Formula, von Frauenmilchbanking. Ähm, so, Zeit. So, Natalie, um, I'm very pleased to have you here. I showered Hello. you with praise, so the anticipation is high. The floor Thank is all you. Yours. I'm uh, very, very grateful to the organizers of this conference for, for the very kind invitation and uh, very sorry that I can't be there in person. I had been um, planning to be there and had planned out a very extensive train journey from where I live um, in the middle of England to Nuremberg, but sadly family events uh, prevented me being able to take the time away. But I think it's also important that we consider uh, what personal role we have in uh, offsetting and mitigating our own carbon footprint. And I had decided to, to travel less by plane and hopefully by the end of the um, conversation today I'll have laid out some more ideas for how our own services, our own milk banks will be able to contribute to the drive towards net zero. So who am I? Well I started my career in medicine training in paediatric surgery and stepped out to undertake a, a period of research which I thought would be quite limited but during that period I met Gillian Weaver um, and anyone who meets Gillian will know her passion for milk banking is unsurpassed and I learned so much from, from her during my PhD um, that I started to understand that this was a very special service that she was running at Queen Charlotte's but it was also a service that had many frustrations largely because of a lack of investment in the service, a lack of funding but also a lack of apparent understanding of what the service could represent uh, for the health of premature babies. So in 2016, I embarked on a very unusual postdoctoral period where Gillian and I set up a charity, the Human Milk Foundation, which operates the Hearts Milk Bank, um, based just north of London, uh, with the principal of the aim of creating equitable access to hospitals who wanted to have access to donor milk. In 2019, I was afford, uh, awarded a fellowship by uh, UK Research and Innovation. And that fellowship's just been extended this week until 2026 and really encompasses a whole program of research about uh, the impact of milk bank services on public health. So the Human Milk Foundation has established a, a range of services and, and projects, principally around the central supply of donor milk to very sick babies in national health service hospitals, but there was always a surplus of milk donated by donors in the community and in hospitals themselves. And so we created the charity in large part to fund that so it would always be free at the point of care to families who were facing breastfeeding challenges that may not involve a premature baby. Um, a large part of the research and innovation that's come from that has looked at the impacts of having donor milk available more broadly. And we believe that education is primarily important, principally for healthcare professionals to understand not only how to use donor milk safely and appropriately, and always in the context of optimal lactation support, but how we can learn from services that are operating around the world. So the primary aim underpinning the Hearts Milk Bank was to fill a gap in research evidence around human milk banking. And our ambition was that if we could create a milk bank large enough to give hospitals equitable and assured provision of donor milk, 
then that could facilitate necessary research and lead to improvements in services. We've been on a fantastic adventure and we're really blessed to have a, a huge team now of over 20 people um, and another 30 to 50 volunteers at any one time uh, to help in our work. And the research spans an enormous array, but right there in the middle is the impact of human milk banking on policy and society. And it was in thinking about issues related to climate change that I started to think that really this was not something that would be um, a another thing to think about, but actually perhaps ish, climate change and milk banking's role within it could be one of the most central points of milk banking services. So our research at the Hearts Milk Bank asked the question of who benefits from milk banking services. And clearly, preterm babies, there is an enormous body of literature now that supports the use in hospital provision. But not just for exclusive, not just for extremely low birth weight babies, but uh, as the WHO has published recommendations on the care of small and sick newborns just last week, uh, it highlights that donor milk should be available for all preterm babies. And it's likely that there will be benefits for donor milk for other babies, those with cardiac and neurological conditions particularly. What we're showing from the 500 families supported through the Hearts Milk Bank is the benefit for mothers, for fathers, for not only the ability to uh, have their wishes around feeding listened to, but um, their psychological well-being. And we're just writing up work showing a reduced uh, impact on anxiety and depression scores for families accessing services. It also seems to support breastfeeding and we are passionate about the care of the donor. Um, women like Adira in this picture who had hyperlactation and really benefited from a program of intensive lactation support to manage that supply down. She still donated over 80 litres to the milk bank but was finally able to latch her baby and leave her flat. Clearly, healthcare professionals are benefiting in the ease of access and understanding more about the research around human milk. And many of you will have seen me present this slide before, showing the atrocious breastfeeding rates in the UK, where fewer than 30% are exclusively feeding their babies uh, at six weeks. We think that might be changing, but there's no government data, national data at the moment to, to show that. But from the line in Brazil, which had comparable breastfeeding rates to the UK's back in the 1970s, and through a whole programme of intervention, including national equitable milk banking services, really changed the cultural perception of what human milk was about. So the question is, what can milk banks do for the planet? Well, back in 2019, I'd been pretty busy with Gillian. We hadn't really rested for three years by that stage, setting up the Hearts Milk Bank. And I was away on my very first holiday uh, for more than three days with my family. And the IPCC, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, published the latest report in early 2019. And the run-up to this had been a lot on media, on documentaries. David Attenborough um, had done a whole series that really emphasised that this was the time that action was needed, that the time for action to kick in was quite limited. Potentially, we only had 10 years to achieve change in our behaviour as humans on this planet to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change. And I like this picture. It was on the front of a National Geographic um, a couple of years ago because I think one of the key issues around climate change is hope. And knowing that if we take even small actions now, those do add up across the planet to achieve a real change. Now, back in 2019, I thought, well, I didn't know very much about this. Does infant feeding even have a carbon footprint? And so I went to the literature and we'd been working with the British Medical Journal on a couple of other issues at that time. And they were they asked whether I could put together an editorial. So I summarised the literature as it was at the time, which was literally two published papers, uh, one from Scandinavia, one from Australia and India, co-authors, and published this uh, editorial suggesting that support for breastfeeding was an environmental imperative. And that really broke down the carbon footprint of infant feeding 
from infant formula into five primary components, the production of dairy. So the average water footprint of cow milk production is about 940 litres of water per kilo of milk. And that's water used for cows to drink and to wash cows down and clean out um, uh, barns and so on. So it takes one kilogram of whole cow milk to give 200 grams of milk powder. So five uh, kilos per kilo of infant formula. And so the water footprint of milk powder alone is over 4,700 litres. Now, the cattle industry is second only to the oil and gas industry in terms of contributing to the production of methane. Methane's a gas that traps heat in the Earth's atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, but 30 times more potently than carbon dioxide. So any intervention to reduce our reliance on cows and agriculture, uh, cow-based farming, is going to be a, a high contributor. The formula industry is clearly burgeoning at the moment, primarily in China, but developing world and, and high resource settings as well. And in terms of waste, the one study from Anacutsidis in South Africa showed 12 years ago that infant formula production globally produces 550 million cans, which is 86,000 tonnes of metal and 364 tonnes of paper added to landfill from external costs, including marketing and so on. So because cow milk is nutritionally inadequate for a developing infant, it has to be supplemented with multiple other ingredients, and that's to approximate the minerals and vitamins required for babies to grow and develop. Now, in particular, infant formula is supplemented with a range of fatty acids, which are absent in cow milk, but essential for neurological development. These supplements include palm oil, a hugely destructive industry uh, that's destroying rainforest, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, as well as fungal, algal oils, and fish oils. Now, no trials have been conducted in a clinical context to show that these supplements are adequate, and many studies are suggesting that they may not be. But what's undeniable is the impact of the transportation of these products and the growth of these products worldwide. And remarkably, transportation is a black hole in our knowledge about the carbon footprint of infant feeding. But a recent study from Phil Baker in New Zealand really highlights the issue. So we had an emergency planning workshop uh, for milk banking a couple of weeks ago with a presentation from a PhD student who's studying formula supply chains. And remarkably, there's only 40 to 50 processing plants worldwide producing millions of tons of infant formula used each year. But these tons can be transported across several continents, not just countries, but continents for different editions of supplements. Sometimes they can go back to a country more than once before being ending up in shops for sale. And um, half of infant formula emissions come from toddler milk, certainly in high resource settings from the data from Australia. Um, toddler milk, so-called follow-on formulas, are unnecessary and, and potentially harmful for infant health. So simply stronger regulation on those formulas could have a large impact on the overall carbon footprint. So in terms of numbers, if we just look at the impact of feeding babies to six months with exclusively infant formula on the left or breastfeeding on the right, the study suggests that um, an additional over 100 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents are, need, are um, produced for every baby fed, which over a global population where up to 60% of infants um, of the 100 million born every year are fed in this manner, that adds up to likely over half a gigaton of carbon emissions. But this is probably a gross underestimate because breastfeeding confers multiple short, medium and long-term benefits, not just to the infant, but to the mother. And as well as avoiding the environmental destruction associated with the production of infant formula, preserving natural resources, it will also have a knock-on impact on the need for people to access healthcare services uh, as much as they are needed. So this was published in the British Medical Journal. It caused 
somewhat of a stir. And it was followed up with an editorial from uh, the editor of the British Medical Journal, really calling for this to be a matter of global concern. Now, the paper went viral. It had two million views on um, within a week and an awful lot of press attention. Not all of it particularly helpful because, as I learned, it's really important when something of this impact goes out that the conclusion is in the title. And the conclusion was clearly that the imperative was on governments to implement services that could support women who wanted to breastfeed to do so. Unfortunately, uh, some media published pieces that suggested that women were being told that they needed to breastfeed. And what we really understand by this stage is this is not an individual uh, failure. This is a failing of society and the structures of services uh, and cultural understanding that are in place. And so uh, five days later, <laughs> we managed to publish uh, myself and Professor Amy Brown, who's a professor of social sciences and psychology at Swansea University, a conversation piece which really emphasised that breastfeeding can help to tackle the climate crisis, but it's really up to governments, uh, not mothers, to be saving the world. Slightly, not our title. Uh, so in 2020, the World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action uh, led for World Breastfeeding Week a campaign around this concept that actually it could adopt the zeitgeist of um, climate change movements across the planet, really highlighting the essential nature of breastfeeding within that. But as I said, this was not received uniformly well, primarily because women grieve breastfeeding after it goes wrong and that grief can last for decades and as we know part of the grief response is anger and many tens of thousands of women in the UK alone are left profoundly angry each year because over 90% of women stop breastfeeding before they planned to or wanted to and that anger really translated into personal uh, anger directed towards me and towards milk banks. And one of the very valid points that people made is you cannot tell us that infant formula is bad when you're sitting with a milk bank full of freezers with bikers and cars coming in and out and all of that pasteurization equipment. You can't tell us what the carbon footprint of donor milk is. And that's true. And so the wonderful thing about being at Imperial College is the diversity of great talent within the university. And there's a fantastic centre for environmental policy, which has had the longest running masters on sustainability in the world, the MSc on environmental technology. So these six students came and spent three months with the Milk Bank and conducted a limited life cycle analysis, which is the climate science approach to understanding the carbon footprint of each stage of human milk banking. And this was limited, so it wasn't the whole assessment, which would take many, many years to do, going way back to how each plastic container is made and, and everything that happens in microbiology labs and so on. But they essentially broke the process down into the three major areas of milk banking processes, those around donation, those at the milk bank and the transportation to hospitals. And I won't spend too long going through the minutiae of it, we're just seeking to publish this at the moment. But essentially, by pulling all of the information together, looking at the um, equipment, the um, standard criteria for how you assess the effect of each exercise, they came up with an approximate carbon footprint for each litre of donor milk produced, which was just over nine kilograms of carbon dioxide. Now, how did that break down? So only 2% only uh, involved the actual office operations, the, all of the team that's involved in bringing milk in and out. Donor activity contributed 15%. Obviously, there's a heavy reliance on electric pumps. Uh, and processing in the milk bank, the freezer contribution, the, the pasteurization was actually quite a small proportion at 12%. The largest contribution came in transportation. And that's because at the time we were a single service 
bringing milk in from quite wide geographical distances um, and on using volunteer motor, uh, blood bikers who ride their own motorbikes. These are all largely diesel powered. And so this really started to give us some clues of what we could do about this, because if we could make an impact on transportation, uh, as well as looking across the whole process of human milk banking, then there was a real opportunity to make a difference to our overall carbon footprint. So if we just take some numbers, at that time we'd supported about 200 families with low milk supply to um, bridge the gap to breastfeeding, and about 70% of women were able to fully breastfeed their baby at the end of the intervention. Now, on average, these women were presenting at about three weeks postnatally, and there was a lot to unpick. So they were lose, using quite high quantities of donor milk, about three litres each. Research from Texas, I'm sure you're aware, uh, some from New York and some from India in the last year, has suggested that early intervention on the postnatal ward can use as little as 50 mils of donor milk, but it enables women to correct the problems that can stack up to become huge problems very early in that process. So we can intervene to bring this down, but that's a longer process. So if we then do some rough back of the envelope calculations, um, of what three litres of donor milk looks like from a carbon footprint perspective as a kind of worst case scenario, then we've still got a net saving that's significant in terms of carbon footprint for each individual family. And this is the point that if every single breastfeeding journey can help with this. And if there are ripple effects that um, make this a much larger operation, then that can only surely be a good thing. So. Taking all of this information, what can milk banks do to adapt to climate change? Because it's here and we're living with the consequences of that every day. How can we offset carbon emissions from milk banking and how can we mitigate to reduce that carbon footprint in the first place? Well, this is the long term strategy of the Human Milk Foundation. The charity is set up around three pillars, the support, um, of individual families, which we believe can only come from driving a change in perception of what human milk and breastfeeding is all about, giving that to government to act upon to create services that enhance the chance of breastfeeding being successful. The supply, ensuring equitable access to human milk, and we're committed to building a national milk bank service that can provide donor milk to both hospitals and the community, and science underpinning everything we do with a significant evidence base. But as well as improving public health, our hope is it, this will reduce NHS costs and have fundamental environmental benefits. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're committed to ensuring equity and we work very closely with NHS milk banks to make sure that donors have the possibility of donating across the country. And so the blue areas on this map are currently where the Hearts Milk Bank team is recruiting donors. And clearly this is a huge geographical range. The transportation, would, the logistics alone would blow my mind, but the carbon footprint would be huge. So after the British Medical Journal was published, we set about creating a network of local hubs. These are areas, uh, these are centres which we hope will grow into centres of lactation support, which have uh, freezers for donor milk going to the hospital and into the community, but also enable local connections of donors. And our ambition is that every county will have at least one hub and these will be fully integrated into healthcare services. We've also placed them in areas that had no milk banking services, including South Wales and Northumberland up in the northeast, where breastfeeding rates are outstandingly poor, initiation rates of maybe 11 or 12 percent. And what we're noticing is that this is driving a real excitement for lactation consultants. There may be only one for a whole county, uh, volunteers who really want are committed to helping support um, their local communities. Um, we also have a slightly different donor recruitment policy because we have a different theoretical risk model for community use. And that means that women who have babies who are too old to be accepted by NHS milk banks can be accepted as a milk donor, which also highlights that breastfeeding isn't just for the first six months and can uh, is 
and important to continue for at least two years. We're committed to supporting um, the very special women uh, who we describe as snowdrop donors. The snowdrop is obviously a symbol of hope, the first flower that flowers in the UK after winter and was chosen by bereaved donors uh, as a term to describe them. And that means that we can now support their recruitment as milk donors um, anywhere across the country. The second is obviously transportation. And we've had a, a vision for moving um, the collection of cars, uh, of milk across the country and the delivery of milk to an electric fleet. And we rather fancifully designed this uh, car wrap which uh, will go around an electric vehicle and then remarkable things happen and three funding bodies including two local charity uh, funders and Swansea University club together and last night we had the first electric vehicle delivered to the Hearts Milk Bank which will be primarily based in Wales uh, which is why we have a Welsh translation of urgent donor human milk which I'm reliably informed translates to human milk in a hurry. Um, and this will be driving around uh, from Sunday, collecting milk locally uh, across South Wales. But it's really the starting point, but we've got to start somewhere. Where we'd also like to move away from is the use of single-use plastics within the pasteurisation process. And that isn't just for carbon footprint reasons and environmental sustainability reasons. I'm sure you're all aware of the recent study from Italy highlighting the presence of microplastics in breast milk. There's obviously more in infant formula. But my suspicion is that after the pasteurisation process of donor milk in plastic bottles, then the microplastic content will be higher. Now, we don't know the impacts of what that is physiologically but um, I think we can probably guess. So can we move to glass? Can we move to another material? Obviously glass has issues of potential breakage, weight and transportation. Could this be worse? And I'm delighted to say that we've just recently won a grant to work with a very innovative company that's based at the same research institute we are to use a specialized form of glass extracted from carbon capture. So actual carbon material extracted from the output of power stations will be prototyped into creating an extremely hard and durable, but incredibly thin and lightweight material for the uh, collection and storage of donor milk. And probably the project we're most proud of and most frustrated by because it's very hard to source land for tree planting in, in the area of the UK where we're based is the Milkwood, a play on the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas's uh, Under Milkwood poem. And this is really the concept is planting trees to offset the um, emissions that we are ultimately always going to be producing. So how can we find other ways to offset that going forward? The idea will be to plant trees related to every donor milk hub um, for many, many reasons. Firstly, to create beautiful places for people to go and visit and we'll have art installations and places that people can learn about the work of the charity and milk banks generally. We can contribute to sustainability by planting the trees. Obviously, we need to plant about two and a half for every litre of donor milk produced. So we need a site uh, for the Hearts Milk Bank at the moment that can plant about 4,000 trees. And we think we might have just found one up in the northeast. There'll be centres of education to enable local children to come and learn about the charity and sustainability in general and provide opportunities for volunteers. But there will also be areas of memorial for the babies who don't survive and who their mothers go on to donate their milk as a tribute by the planting of snowdrop bulbs and many other plants. And I just wanted to draw my talk to a close, I'm talking about these two very special twins who were born at 34 weeks gestation. Um, their mum was extremely ill afterwards in intensive care herself, and they're called Seren and Rowan. And sadly, the hospital criteria was only to provide donor milk for those less than 32 weeks. So these babies didn't qualify, even though their mother was very unwell. Now, she also happened to be a breastfeeding support uh, counsellor and incredibly committed. And the local community really rallied around the, the baby's father 
and enabled him to advocate for the hospital to allow donor milk to be brought in from the Hearts Mill Bank um, and used to feed these babies. Now, amazingly, last week, the local council finally rang and said that they had enabled us not to plant a milk wood, but to plant the first milk tree. And the tree that will be planted is the white rowan, which will blossom like this in in the springtime and produce beautiful berries in the wintertime. So Saren and Rowan will be there when that tree gets planted. We'll make sure they are. Uh, they're even older than this now and absolutely thriving. And the real happy news of this story is that the mother recovered and is still breastfeeding these babies. Uh, now they are three years old. So what do milk banks need? Well, clearly we need upscaled milk banking infrastructure um, to meet the growing demand that will come. But we need a cohesive plan. And this clearly came from the emergency planning workshop that we held, which I hope that we'll be able to publish the proceedings from, because we're going to be living with climate change and all the risks that that will bring. Uh, we've experienced flooding, we've had heat waves, we've got intense cold and snow. Other countries are experiencing even worse outcomes. How can we make sure that milk banking services are protected from the worst elements of climate change, that we're prepared, that we have a plan for service continuity? Um, because in the UK, we don't. And that's really the job of work that we're starting now. How can milk banks become resilient, not just in funding, but also in innovation in the techniques that we can implement? Because ultimately, milk banks are at the heart of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, especially those around reducing uh, hunger, increasing um, preventing childhood mortality, and decreasing the risk of non-communicable disease, and primarily supporting cognitive development and education. So I will draw my talk to a close there. I really would welcome any questions. But what would be just fantastic is if there could be movements to creating German milk woods, those across Europe um, and further afield, or thinking of other ways um, creating this network that we have through the Global Alliance of Milk Banks and Associations and through the European Milk Bank Association to really make sure that we can all think of, of ways to help in this great effort. And thank you. You, you didn't oh, hear the loud applause. Um, thank you again for this for this very interesting talk. I think it's important that we have people like you who come forward with new ideas and new concepts for milk banking while we are just struggling, you know, during the shifts and in our own milk bank. So it was very, very interesting. Um, time for a couple of questions. So are there any questions from the audience at the moment? Just let me perhaps start with the question. So, so many ideas you brought forward. I just will pick one. So, you were talking about the disposable plastic containers from, for like, treating and storing the milk. Um, so, what do you say to, uh, to my, um, hy to my um, hygienic department? Because they say for hygienic reasons, we can only use disposable plastic containers. And it's a huge amount of plastic we generate each day. So what would be your answer to that? Yes, I mean, can you hear me okay? Because my... We can hear you. Ah, oh, fantastic. Um, so clearly, you know, at present, we don't have data to suggest that reusing plastic is effective. But if that data could be created, then there's no reason that um, containers potentially couldn't be reused again. Obviously, we'd not only be needing to look at infection risk, but the increased risk of microplastic um, yields, which we know when containers are, are used multiple times can cause a problem. It's one of the problems of infant formula is that obviously the, the bottles are sterilized multiple times, which destabilizes the plastic. Um, so if we can conduct the studies to show this, then it's possible. But also, if we can be innovative about the materials used and use non-reactive materials such as glass, which is already a common practice in many parts of the world, Brazil and, and North America, um, you know, this is one of the great advantages of having this international collaborative framework, 
is that we can ask the question and see how milk banks in different settings are, are thinking uh, of their different processes may actually be more appropriate, more applicable um, for other milk banks. But at the moment, we can only do what we can do. And <laughs> it's, it's not trying to climb a mountain in one go, but just take small steps. Okay, I understand. Okay. So you're we just need to provide the data to show that what we're doing is actually harmful uh, to the babies, and then we, we from there on be going to be able to change. Yeah, and I think the argument with the microplastics is quite compelling to move away. So, a question from the audience. Uh, would it be possible to use something like stainless steel? Has that been tested? Do you know of anything along those lines? I think Gillian's in the room, and, and I know that steel has been used, but it, it's very heavy. Um, and so for transportation, that can be a problem. Whether um, materials could be used within the milk bank and then aliquoted into different containers uh, is another matter. We can't currently do that in the UK according to the NICE recommendations, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence recommendations on how to operate a human milk bank because it hasn't been um, uh, confirmed to be safe to open containers after pasteurisation. But again, if we can provide evidence uh, that we have good manufacturing process, that we have lab safety, um, then Potentially, this is something we can work towards again. I can just answer the question in the steel. It has been it has been used. It is used. It's used widely in India, um, and may mention um, later. But um, uh, it is very heavy, um, and uh, also quite costly. I think um, would be um, and very say anyone who's lifted baskets of milk into and out of pasteurizers will know that. Um, Sort of thirty odd containers of stainless steel would be would be hard work. I've worked in milk banking so long that I remember when the plastic containers were um, reused, um, and we needed to employ people to be able to wash them, and clean them, and dry dry them, and um, disinfect them, and uh, and so on. And saving one person's salary enabled us to buy the disposable bottles, but. They can be recycled at least, so making sure that all of the containers that to go into the plastic recycling is, is one thing until there's something better. Thank you, Jillian. Are there any sort of questions? So they are, they are in the so our online um, audience appreciate your talk as well. Um, so we have in Freiburg, we collect the milk within the city area with um, the bicycle courier service. So, but then this is Freiburg, uh, which is very famous for wanting to be very green. And uh, so, but then again, so what would you say, what are the means of transport? You showed your example with the, with the bicycles, with the e-car, but you know, I mean, this energy does need to come from somewhere as well. So what are your further plans? Are you planning to expand your fleet of cars or, or do you use drones? Yeah. With our drones <laughs> yesterday? Uh -huh. well, yeah. that's, that's why I'm, I'm uh, grinning because really we could be entering the future uh, very quickly with this and drones are being used for the transportation of medical products uh, in many areas of the world. Gillian, again, please talk to her at the, the coffee break because she's um, leading on a whole package of work um, that's implementing drone usage in North America, in Estonia, in Australia, in Indonesia, and hopefully soon in Swansea. Um, because Wales is... Um, representative of areas in the country where it can be quite difficult to pick milk up and to deliver milk because the transport network is not is not great. Um, the university is a centre of, um, of climate science and so they already have drone ports and stations and it, it could be 
a relatively simple place to implement infrastructure that can do that. And if we're thinking about long term, then the upfront environmental costs of implementing some relatively small infrastructure would be would be possible. We've got a paper in review at the moment looking at the, the carbon footprint of implementing drone usage, um, which suggests it's quite a high cost initially, but then over many years that that would be worth it. Um, Electric cars, again, the car will be charged at Swansea University and powered through solar um, and wind turbine uh, use that they have on site. Um, they also have uh, an engineering group that's produced the first completely carbon neutral building. So if we ever manage to move to a <laughs> bespoke milk bank, uh, who knows, maybe the entire building will be carbon neutral. But I think it's... Uh, at the moment, I'm caught between dreaming and the hard, solid reality that it's really difficult to get things done, uh, as evidenced by the fact it's currently taken us three years to find a place to put one tree. So, you know, we can't claim that we're on the way, but hearing what happens in Freiburg is, is amazing. We really need to be pooling these ideas together um, so we can learn from each other. Because there might be some quite simple things that we just haven't thought of yet. So, Natalie, again, there are no further questions from the auditorium. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. And I'm really looking forward to see pictures from your milk route in the years to come. Milk Thank tree. You. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone.